course, the idea of whether we can get computers to plan, solve problems in reason. And in the 1950s, Alan Turing, the, the great computer scientist, asked the question, can machines think? And importantly, how would you know if a machine could think? And that has led to what we've called for many years the Turing test. Um, at that point in which you can't tell whether you're communicating, for example, with a computer, the computer is said to pass the Turing test. And this is an exciting time because for the last few years, there are credible examples of computers passing the Turing test. Uh, Google Assistant is one example with a really nice um, example of a computer scheduling a haircut appointment over the telephone and, and the human on the other end had no idea they're talking to a computer. You can find this example on YouTube and uh, it's very, very compelling. And uh, if you work in the AI space, there's really two general approaches, top down and bottom up. And top down is the basic idea of building a machine that mimics the human mind. If you think of data from Star Trek as an example, it's really more of an engineering exercise and is quite challenging. There are people that work in this space, but what most of us do is bottom up AI, things like deep learning neural networks and cellular automata are examples of simple uh, computational building blocks that jointly produce a complex behavior and are able to uh, solve problems. And that's really going to be the focus of my talk today is bottom up AI. Uh, and just as a point of trivia, AI, uh, the term AI was coined at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire in the United States in 1956 at a workshop where a lot of the leading People in the field, people like Marvin Minsky got together and said, hey, we need a name for our field. Uh, at that time, they were calling it all kinds of different things like cybernetics. Uh, and they came up with the phrase artificial intelligence to describe the discipline. And that's the phrase we, of course, use today. Now, AI in medicine has had a very interesting history going back to the 1950s and 60s, where there was a lot of excitement about AI. If you think about that time, computers were new after World War II. And pr prior to that time, AI was really more of a science fiction or ph philosophical exercise. And then when computers came on the scene, people got excited because we could start to implement the first artificial intelligence algorithms. And during the 1970s and 80s, there was a lot of hype. And if you think about this period of time, that's really when the, the home computer came on the scene. 1977 was a big year. That was the year of the Apple II computer, the Commodore PET. Uh, the Radio Shack TRS-80 home computers all came out and were mass marketed, putting computers in the hands of people. So there was a lot of excitement around this time. And of course, programming languages were uh, developing and maturing rapidly. Um, and so people started implementing some of the first AI algorithms and applying them in medicine. Uh, Ted Shortliff uh, developed the Mycin program, which was an expert system for prescribing antibiotics to ICU patients that came out in the early 1970s. So there was a lot of hype, but of course, then there was the realization that the AI that was developed wasn't solving the kinds of problems we wanted it to solve. And there was a lot of disappointment. And that led to what we've called for more than 20 years, the AI winter. And of course, all that changed in 2010. And I'll, I'll mention what that was in a minute, but we are now in this period of time where AI is becoming quite uh, quite prevalent in multiple disciplines of medicine with uh, a number of success stories. Um, and so we're now in this, this era where AI is everywhere and being applied to everything um, with some success. So of course in 2010, IBM Watson uh, was released and uh, beat the, uh, the Jeopardy champion. And this was a real tour de force and I think many consider this the end of the AI winter because this was the first real big demonstration of AI uh, in a human competitive form. Uh, and Watson really combined a lot of great technology, natural language processing, automated reasoning, machine learning, et cetera. And, and, and to beat the Jeopardy champion, to beat these human, the best human competitors in the world was quite a, quite a feat. And uh, Watson, recognizing, IBM recognizing that they had something special, uh, decided to, of course, capitalize on this for business purposes. And the field that they decided to throw Watson at was the healthcare domain, and they rolled out Watson for oncology. 
to on uh, some of the early applications of Watson were for prescribing uh, chemotherapy for cancer patients. And a lot of cancer, some big cancer centers such as MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston and Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City signed on and paid many millions of dollars uh, to IBM for Watson, put it to the test. And as we now know, it uh, didn't really live up to the hype and wasn't able to compete out compete clinicians uh, at tasks such as prescribing chemotherapy. And so Watson got quite a bit of blowback about this, some bad negative headlines. This is my favorite negative headline. IBM Watson is the Donald Trump of the AI industry. I think uh, that's pretty harsh. I don't think IBM deserved that. I don't think Watson deserved that comment. But um, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of where some of the, the media was at uh, at the time. Um, and you know, my personal take on Watson was that IBM pushed it out too fast. And as I think you'll get a sense from my talk, the healthcare domain, uh, applying AI and machine learning in the healthcare domain is very, very challenging. And I don't think IBM was quite, didn't quite realize how challenging it would be. And this is a, this is a nice uh, overview for those of you that are interested in this story and wanna, wanna read more about IBM Watson and what happened. This came out about a year ago in IEEE Spectrum Magazine. So what I want to do today is cover what I think are some of the important challenges. There are more than 20, and I'm going to divide these up into 10 challenges um, for working with clinical data from the electronic health record, and then 10 challenges of, of machine learning that we need to uh, make progress on if we're going to successfully apply machine learning to uh, healthcare questions. Now, number one, um, uh, electronic health record data is extremely complex. There's lots of different kinds of data coming from lots of different sources. Um, and this is, a, this is a nice overview figure from Griffin Weber and Zach Kohani from a JAMA paper in 2014, thinking about all the different sources of data, different kinds of data. So this is the first challenge is there's just a lot of different kinds of data from different sources. And it's tough to put your head around uh, all the different kinds of data and what it means. The second one is I think what uh, many of us struggle with on a daily basis is that EHR data is extremely messy. Um, first of all, it's not, electronic health records are not designed for research. They're designed for clinical care and for billing purposes. There's no inherent study design. So if you're an epidemiologist, electronic health record data makes you feel very uncomfortable because there is no study design to it. The technology is inconsistent, right? Uh, health systems, hospitals change technology very, very often, but you don't know that from the electronic health record. So for a particular measure that you might be looking at over 10 years, there could be 10 or 12 or 15 different instruments that were used from different, provide, different uh, vendors that were used to generate that, that data. And you would not know that, but it could um, introduce bias, systematic biases and measurement error. Um, patients come in and out of health systems and hospitals all the time. So we have inconsistent patient encounters that creates uh, some issues. Data can be very sparse. The figure on the right is a, a figure I pulled from a paper in Nature. Uh, each row is a different clinical or uh, biomarker that was measured. Uh, each column is a different patient, uh, and the gray is missing data. That's where the data points were not observed for those particular measures. And you can see this is pretty, pretty messy data. This is a paper in Nature with some interesting findings. So this, you know, this has to be dealt with through imputation or data cleaning. Um, some key data that you might want to look at is not captured in the electronic health record. Uh, I'll touch more on that in a few minutes. Um, the electronic health record itself is inflexible. Most electronic health records these days come from vendors such as Epic that make the changes. And getting a big company like Epic to change an electronic health record takes a lot of work. Um, so you, and it's, it's difficult to make those changes yourself. There's a temporal component which can be challenging and uh, often clinical data exists across multiple databases. It's not all integrated in one database. Um, okay, number three are billing codes. Um, the patient diagnoses that you find if you're interested in studying health and disease um, are not always accurate. They're, um, 
uh, the diagnoses that are entered by clinicians are usually for billing purposes, for recovering money from health insurance companies. At least that's true here in the United States. And um, and so as a result, if you want to say do a case control study uh, in observational data from the electronic health record, you might not want to identify your cases solely on ICD uh, billing codes uh, because clinicians use them for billing purposes and often to maximize billing rather than to serve as an accurate diagnosis of a patient. So this is a figure we put together in one of our recent papers to um, highlight what's called phenotype mining and that if you really want to identify accurate cases and controls, you need to consider all kinds of other things like um, what's in the clinical notes that are recorded, what medications are the patients on, what, um, what are the values of important laboratory tests that might indicate whether somebody has a disease or not. And so you need to take all of these things into consideration. Now, um, clinical data for all of us to make sure that we're talking about the same thing, we need standards and terminologies. And so this is a big area of biomedical informatics. How do we standardize the language and the terminologies that we use to describe clinical data so that each of us is sure we're talking about the same thing? Um, this is uh, a big area of research and ongoing. There's no perfect solution to this, um, but something we need to think about as we work with clinical data. And then if we wanna integrate clinical data from multiple different electronic health records, each electronic health record might be in a different format and present data differently. So how do you know if you're doing an analysis in several different electronic health records, how do you know that you're talking about the same thing, that you're analyzing the same data? So we need common data models and OMOP is an example of one that's becoming quite popular that we have adopted here at Penn Medicine um, so that you can map your EHR data from different sources onto a common data model. And then that gives you the confidence that when you analyze the data from each source that you're working with the same data. And then of course, ontologies are important, uh, which describe the relationships among the data. This can be very important for designing databases and for doing inference on the data, for understanding the data. And this is a very hot area and we do not have enough biomedical ontologists um, in biomedical informatics and need more. Um, um, and this is really a, a critical area of research that's uh, I think very much under underappreciated in um, uh, among people that work with clinical data. Now, if you could do a good job of all of that, then uh, the goal is to integrate the data in a data warehouse uh, where you can then query the data and do research with it. Um, and setting up a data warehouse is a lot of work and very complicated uh, and very much dependent on standards and terminologies and common data models and biomedical ontologies. And then, as I mentioned earlier, EHR data doesn't always, um, uh, electronic health records don't always have all the, all the data that you're interested in. If you're interested in human health, then you need to know something about the ecosystem of the patients the lifestyle of the patients, what, you know, what are, are they taking alcohol? Are they taking drugs? What is their sleep behavior? Uh, the social factors, soci socioeconomic factors, and then of course all the physical and chemical things that we're exposed to, the things we drink uh, in our drinking water, the, the chemicals that we're exposed to in our food, et cetera. So how do, you, how do you then take data from all these other external sources and integrate it so that you can ask and answer more informative questions about health? Um, data security and privacy is a huge concern and there have been a lot of data breaches over the last few years with private clinical data, personal health information being exposed and even sold on the black market. Um, so this is, a, this is an ongoing concern that we struggle with every day, how to, how to keep from getting, getting hacked. Uh, and then data sharing and governance. Um, health systems and hospitals have a lot of committees and structures in place to protect the data and to make sure it's used responsibly. And this can, can be a barrier um, that needs to be overcome to get access to, to clinical data. And so my main message here is, again, not to discourage, um, but to encourage uh, people to work with clinical data. We have a lot of problems to solve, but um, 
But I think the main message is if you jump into working with clinical data from electronic health records, there uh, are no shortcuts. There are no easy paths um, to working with this kind of data. It's hard work. <clears throat> and um, but the but the payoff can be huge um, if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and and do the hard work of um, uh, addressing the uh, the challenges that I presented. And just to give you a quick example, uh, some of you have probably followed the story of these two papers in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet that were on COVID-19 that were recently retracted. And these papers were written by a company called Surgisphere, which claimed to have aggregated electronic health record data from hundreds of hospitals from around the world. Now, COVID has only been on the scene since, you know, January, February. Um, and so they claim to have aggregated data from all these different countries in March and April addressed all the concerns that I just talked about, done an analysis, wrote these papers, got them peer reviewed and published in a very extremely short amount of time. The bottom line is it appears that all of the clinical data that this company had been working with was completely fabricated because it's not realistic that they would have been able to overcome all the challenges I just mentioned uh, to analyze this data and come to some healthcare uh, conclusions. So that's why these papers were ultimately uh, retracted. Very interesting story if you haven't been following it. And this is a paper I would say is a success story. This is a, a, a paper done by Google in collaboration with Atoll Butte and some other people, other academics looking at a couple hundred thousand patients and 46 billion data points. And uh, Google did a lot of work to get all this data integrated to a point where they could do machine learning on it. And so um, Atoll in his keynote later may uh, mention this paper and you might ask him how much time it took for Google to aggregate all this data and how much person power it took for Google to aggregate, clean, integrate, and analyze all this data just as a contrast to the retracted papers. <clears throat> all right, I wanna spend the last few minutes um, going over some of the machine learning challenges which are also significant. And this is how I think about the machine learning pipeline going from the left from data to data integration. You might wanna do some feature selection, feature engineering. Then you have to pick one or more machine learning methods and tune the parameters. And then once you arrive at a model, you need to interpret it, validate it, and then hopefully get to the point of clinical application. So the first challenge I wanna mention is what machine learning method do you pick? Every, every machine learning method looks at data in a different way as shown in the top figure here. And how do you know which you, you don't know beforehand what method is appropriate for the data that you're working with and the question that you're asking? What, what is the pattern that you're looking for? You don't know. You're looking for the pattern. And so this is one of the big challenges of machine learning is how do you pick the right machine learning method? Now, I'm, I've been working the last five years in a hot new area called automated machine learning. Um, trying to take some of this guesswork off the user and letting the computer figure out the optimal machine learning method. And we've developed uh, one of the first automated machine learning methods called the tree-based pipeline optimization tool or TPOD. And this is a paper that just came out earlier this year um, on some enhancements that we've made to scale TPOT to working with big data like electronic health record data. And one of the ways we do that is by organizing the features into feature subsets using biology or clinical knowledge to do so. And then incorporating a feature subset selector, which can be incorporated into the pipeline, the uh, machine learning pipelines that TPOT is automatically constructing. And this is work done by my postdoc, Trang Lee. Um, uh, here's a review paper that just came out a few months ago in artificial intelligence and method in medicine on automated machine learning. Our TPOT method is listed here as one of the methods that's reviewed. And on the right side is a book called on automated machine learning by Frank Cutter and his colleagues. Um, and this is an open source book, uh, open access book uh, published by Springer. So you have access to all the chapters and we have a chapter on TPOT in this book and some of the other early and popular automated machine learning methods are also covered. So um, one of the approaches in machine learning, especially in deep learning applications, is just taking all of the data, all of the features, 
um, and throwing them at the machine learning method. I, I think that's the wrong approach. I think we can be smarter about selecting the features uh, that go into a machine learning analysis. I think that makes the machine learning analysis easier, more computationally efficient, and it makes the interpretation on the back end much easier. Now, there are computational methods shown on the top here that you can use to do feature selection. I'm a big fan of the uh, Relief F family of machine learning algorithms that have a lot of nice properties. There are many others. But there are also biology-based or clinically-based ways to do feature selection. Um, if you're doing a, a genome-wide association study, you could select your SNPs based on genes or regulatory regions or pathways, et cetera. Um, and this is a uh, recent review that we did on Relief F based feature selection methods, a very comprehensive review looking at all the relief F methods, which I like because they can capture interactions among features without the computational complexity of an exhaustive search, for example. Now, one of the things to think about is that the features, the variables in the data, and this is especially true for electronic health record data, don't always come to us in the right format or don't always individually capture the biological measure that we want to capture. And so some degree of feature engineering might be necessary where feature engineering is the basic idea of, of recoding the features or combining features um, to more effectively capture the information that, you're, that the machine learning algorithm needs to, uh, needs to model. Uh, this is a recent paper that we did. This is a feature engineering method developed by a research associate in my lab, Bill LaCava, called the Feature Engineering Automation Tool, or FEAT, which basically uses tree-based algorithms to combine features and mathematical functions in a way that makes the features more informative when you plug them into something like a linear regression method. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to do this, but in my experience, feature selection and feature engineering can do a lot of the hard work that something like a deep learning algorithm might be doing. And so if you do a good job of this beforehand, you might not need a deep learning algorithm. You might be able to get away with something simpler like linear or logistic regression or a decision tree. Uh, reproducibility is important. This is something we worry a lot about in machine learning, how reproducible are the results. Um, and of course, one way to address that is to look at generalizability across multiple data sets. But of course, with electronic health record data, this is difficult because of the privacy and security issues. So there's a lot of interest in privacy, preser preserving distributed algorithms where you run your analysis on the EHRs locally where you don't have the privacy concerns and then you aggregate the results um, and integrate the results to look for an overall pattern or to reproduce the results. This is a paper we did with Yong Chen um, doing exactly what I just said within the context of logistic regression and combining likelihoods which don't have the privacy issues um, after you've analyzed each individual uh, set of electronic health record data. And then, of course, reproducible, re reproducibility comes in play at the workflow level. Uh, this is a nice paper by Brett Ballou Jones and Casey Green from a couple years ago, looking at you know, things like Docker containers and Docker images as a way to uh, reproduce uh, an analysis and taking some of, the, some of the systematic or random error out of uh, running analyses at different institutions, for example. And this is a couple papers I've uh, been involved with um, reviewing some of these reproducibility uh, issues. Uh, the first was published uh, just recently in Giga Science and the second in PLOS Biology. And then if you develop machine learning methods, uh, benchmarking is a key issue. How do you, how do you know that uh, the new machine learning algorithm that you've developed is competitive with other machine learning methods on particular types of data. Um, this is a paper that was just posted on archive a few days ago that um, I helped out a little bit with on um, um, thinking about best practices and open issues on benchmarking machine learning and optimization methods. And this is um, a new benchmark data uh, part of a new benchmark set of data that we're getting ready to release in a couple weeks and getting ready to post a paper on archive. Um, here, we're, we, what we've done is used an AI algorithm 
to develop mathematical functions that generate data that differentiate optimally between multiple different machine learning methods. So what we did was ask the AI algorithm to invent uh, mathematical functions for which certain machine learning methods do well, certain machine learning methods do poorly, and for which we have a lot of variability in performance of different machine learning methods. And we've generated 40 of these benchmarks with different orderings of methods, different methods performing well, and different methods performing not so well. And on the right side is an example of how you would use these 40 benchmark data sets. Uh, so the third column uh, from the right here is a method we did not include in the benchmark that we applied to these benchmark data sets. And we can see across the 40 data sets in the rows here, which, which data sets uh, the method is performing well on. In this case, this is an extra trees classifier and where it's not performing well and how it compares to other machine learning methods. And this can give you some ideas about where, you know, where your machine learning method is falling short. And because you know the generative functions that generated the data, you can go back and study those and get, maybe get some ideas about how to improve your method. And then interpretation, of course, is um, something we all worry about a lot and is perhaps the biggest challenge of machine learning is how do you make sense of these methods and we've uh, there are a lot of different areas of interpretation we've we've worked in a couple of uh, different areas um, visualization i think has a very important role to play this is a a new r package that we just released this is work done by trang lee in my lab a postdoc um, and this is called tree heater which basically combines heat maps of features and endpoints with a decision tree so that you can see where um, you can see basically how the features map onto the endpoint in the decision tree by studying the heat map. So some very simple visualization tools like this can go a long way to decomposing a complex machine learning model and being able to see the patterns for yourself that, that the, uh, the machine learning algorithm is, is generating. Uh, and this is a vault, uh, available online as an R package. And then one of the other things we've done is looked at feature importance scores. So you can, when you do a machine learning analysis, look at the individual features and the impact that they have on the overall performance of the machine learning algorithm. And that can provide some information about, um, about the role of the features and help you interpret the models. This is a nice paper that Bill LaCava, a research associate in my lab, did in collaboration with Sarah Pendergrass and Chris Bauer from Geisinger Clinic here in Pennsylvania which is a health system. And they looked at about 900,000 patients, electronic health record data for predict, predicting clinical endpoints such as diabetes, and then looked at the feature importance scores from different machine learning methods. And what they found was that there was tremendous variability and disagreement between the different feature importance scores, which um, again, hints at some of the complexity that I was talking about, about electronic health record data. Um, and we, what we were able to show is that permutation-based feature importance scores have more consistency than the standard feature importance scores in methods like random forest and XGBoost. So anyway, just a, a word of caution that um, interpretation uh, metrics can be quite heterogene heterogeneous for electronic health record data. And this is one of my favorite areas is interestingness. We have lots of objective measures of the performance of uh, machine learning methods, things like sensitivity and specificity and uh, et cetera. Um, but I think what we often don't pay enough attention to are the subjective measures because they're subjective, but these ultimately are the things we're most interested in. Is the result surprising? This is why we do machine learning rather than standard parametric statistical methods. We're looking for those surpri surprising results that would otherwise be missed. Is the result novel? How many times have you seen a machine learning paper that says, hey, we found something somebody else found? Well, that's good, but that's not novel. So you're looking for those novel results. Is it useful? Is the machine learning model that you've generated useful? Is it, and is it clinically actionable? And so I think we need to build in more of these kinds of subjective measures into our machine learning analyses. I'm a big believer that machine learning needs to be accessible and easy. We live in a big data world. Everybody who wants to do machine learning should have access to easy to use machine learning tools. And this is a, a project uh, we've worked on for the last three or four years. It's called Pen AI. 
And this is a automated machine learning method that we've made with a intuitive user interface, uh, super easy to use. So all you have to do is load your data file as a CSV file and push this button and the automated machine learning method takes over and runs, uh, automatically runs machine, what it thinks are the best machine learning methods on your data set and does the hyperparameter tuning. And it does that by learning from experience. And the more machine learning uh, uh, results it has in its database, the better it gets at recommending a machine learning algorithm for your data set. So this is completely automated. It's super user friendly. You can do uh, you can do an interactive machine learning analysis by pushing a few buttons, and we have a nice dashboard for results. This is open source, and we have a paper that was just accepted in bioinformatics uh, showing evaluating this method. So not only is it user friendly, but it's quite powerful, and it's competitive with the best automated machine learning methods out there. Fairness and bias is a big issue here now, especially since the spotlight's been, been put on um, structural and institutional racism and other, other issues of bias. And machine learning and AI algorithms are not immune to these kinds of biases. Um, and if the data is biased, the machine learning algorithm is going to be biased. Uh, this is a paper from Science highlighting uh, racial bias in a commonly used healthcare algorithm. And this is a book by two of my colleagues here at the University of Pennsylvania that just that came out within the last year uh, on, uh, on ethics and machine learning and AI. This is Michael Kearns and Aaron Roth. All right, finally, number 20, ultimately what we wanna do is take machine learning models and put them into clinical practice and make them part of what we call the learning health system where the health system is constantly learning and improving its healthcare practices from data, from things like machine learning results. But this is challenging. How do you do this? How do you build a clinical decision support tool around a machine learning model and put that into clinical practice? And how do you deliver that mes message to the clinician on the front lines of providing healthcare? Um, how, do you, how do you incorporate this into their workflow such that they actually pay attention to it in their, their busy schedule? So um, we have a lot of work to do on integrating machine learning results into learning health systems. Okay, so I'll um, stop there. Um, this is a summary of the 20 challenges I covered. I think we, we have a lot of significant challenges on the data side that all need to be taken into consideration when we do machine learning. And then of course the machine learning itself has a lot of challenges and Again, I don't wanna discourage people, I wanna encourage people that there are an enormous number of opportunities. Um, I started my career in the genetics, genomics, bioinformatics, comp bio space, and have moved more recently into the electronic health record space. And, I, and I'm really excited about the opportunities. And for those of you that would like to jump into this, I, I, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, I'm morejh on Twitter. Here's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to send you a PDF of the slide. So just shoot me an email and I'll email you the PDF back. Um, or if you have follow-up questions or see ways we can collaborate, uh, or if you're interested in some of our software tools or methods, let me know. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Jason, for wonderful insight into data standards and ontologies, data models you know, the ML methods, you know, feature selection and benchmarks and so on. So we, now we have time for the questions. Uh, uh, participant, please enter your questions in the Q and A. So let's start, we have, let's start with the questions. Um, Peter uh, Tran, he has a question. How does Pen AI compare or contrast to something like Google's auto ML? We have not compared uh, Pen AI directly to Google's AutoML solution, um, but what I will say is that we were two years ahead of Google in releasing our AutoML method. Our Teapot method was uh, well well ahead of uh, Google in that space. Um, but we have compared Pen AI to AutoSklearn and uh, some of the other um, common. Uh, auto ML methods and it's competitive with all of them and performs as well as uh, uh, AutoSklearn and, and the other methods in, in the space. So we're very, and that paper is on archive um, and uh, will be coming out in bioinformatics um, probably in a month or two. And uh, I'd be happy to send you a, 
um, a link to that if you can't find it. Um, so you can see the, uh, the direct head-to-head uh, -head comparison. Um, but we're, we're confident um, that it's, it's powerful. Um, um, but let me, let me say that Pen AI is, is really, as opposed to Teapot, Teapot was really for the machine learner for the computer scientist to use uh, as a powerful auto ML method. Pen AI is really designed at the naive user, the person who has never done machine learning before. Um, you know, the Google tools, um, the other tools in this space can be quite difficult to use. Pen AI, anybody can use Pen AI. The hardest part is just getting it installed. Once you install it, anybody can use it. Like I said, a two-year-old can use Pen AI. You load your data, you push a button, and you're doing machine learning on your data. And that was really the goal of Pen AI. What, we didn't set out to create the most powerful AutoML method with Pen AI. We set out to, to create the most user-friendly to democratize AI and bring it to the masses. It, it just so happened that uh, my, my research associate, Bill LaCava, who developed the recommender system for Pen AI, did such a good job that it actually is quite, quite competitive. So the next question uh, thank, uh, from Anna Beatrice around missing values. What would you recommend to do with missing clinical values? Does imputation have a good performance? Would it be better to exclude those features? Or the only way would be to collect new data. Thank, you. thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a great question. This is one of the biggest challenges of working with EHR data is the missingness, and it's 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 naturally there's just naturally a lot of missing data because of the way patients enter and exit a health system and how they enter and exit different clinics. Um, so it's just an, an inherent problem. Now we've done a couple papers comparing some of the popular imputation algorithms like MICE on electronic health record data. We also developed a deep learning algorithm for imputing missing data and published a paper on that. Um, so uh, I personally prefer imputation to throwing data away. I think if you threw missing data away, you would throw away most of your data because there's just so much of it in, in electronic health record data. Um, so I think imputation is probably the right way to go, but imputation is challenging. There's no one right way to do it. Um, so this, this is an area that needs a lot more attention, a lot more investigation. The next question from anonymous attendee, a lot have talked about fairness issues, but how do you tackle challenges in this domain? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, one of the one of the the best ways to tackle fairness is to look at the data itself, and is 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 the data um, representative of the the problem you're trying to study, and does it have, for example, racial biases in it? Um, I am a, on a, a a uh, dissertation committee for a graduate student here at Penn Medicine, an epidemiology student who's looking at uh, electronic health record data from visits to the emergency room. Uh, so she's working with emergency care doctors. And unfortunately, um, people of color are not treated the same way as white patients are in emergency rooms. Their illnesses and things that need attention are prioritized differently. And that is, doc you can document that in the data. Uh, and so if you're doing a machine learning analysis of data collected from the emergency room, or if you're looking at a, emergency uh, ICU, for example, ICU endpoints, um, you know, those patients could get treated very differently in the emergency room and prioritized and could receive very different care. And then that creates a bias that a machine learning algorithm is going to exploit. So I think we, the best thing to do is to look at the data and make sure our data are unbiased. Um, and then we can look at actual algorithmic ways to, to deal with bias. Thanks, Jason. Next question from Karine. Uh, nice talk. On your penaia.org platform, can you feed it with any kind of data. Can you provide data sets for training and then independent data set for testing? Yeah, so you would treat those. Um, so first of all, yes, you can feed it any kind of data and, and the newest version will handle both discrete and continuous endpoints. So it can do both classification and regression. Um, <clears throat> um, we don't have, we're, we're 
getting on our list of short list of things to do is to provide a feature for validating Penn AI models on independent data. I don't think that's live yet, but hopefully will be in the next few months. But what you can do, Penn AI will write the Python code for you. So once you have a model that you're happy with on your training data, you can push a button and download the Python code and that, that will run that machine learning analysis. And you can take that Python code and then apply it to an independent data set to validate it. So that's one of the really neat features of Penn AI is that it writes the Python code for you. Um, or you could load your independent validation data set and run Penn AI again and see if it comes up with the right answer. That would be another way to do it. But we're building in a way to load a data set and validate a specific model into Penn AI. Thank you. Jessica. We have two more questions. Maybe if you can answer it quickly, then we will move on. Uh, from uh, James Kai, what in your opinion or uh, for some ML opportunities to address the quality issues in EHR? What are the so about the uh, to address the quality issues of the electronic health records? Yeah, you know, There's quality is messy. really difficult thing because it can't be purely addressed algorithmically. You have to work with clinicians who are intimately familiar with the data that's being collected to address the quality control issues. So that takes work. It takes collaboration, and that's my best advice for how to address quality: is to work with clinicians who are committed to quality uh, and then combine that with algorithmic approaches. So next question from Martin Easter. Uh, can you share any references on the topic of ML and the learning health system? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. What are the topic differences? of ML and the learning health system. Oh, uh, learning. The learning health system. Yeah, the learning, the learning health system is just the idea that um, a hospital, a health system learns from experience, right? That you take the data that's been collected in the EHR, you analyze it, you develop models, you validate those models. And if you learn something, then you feed that back into the health system to improve healthcare. And that that process is a continuous process, that there's a culture of, of learning from experience and learning from the data to make the healthcare process better. That, that, so, so the so it's a it's a multi pronged approach that basically includes everybody in a health system, including the machine learners. And machine learning is just one component of that. There are two more questions. Maybe can, can you use deep pod for genomics data or multivomics specifically? Maybe could you keep it short? Can you use deep pod for genomics data? Yeah, in fact, um, the first examples that we have done with Teapot are, are with genomics data. In fact, the bioinformatics paper that I, uh, is, that I listed on the slide that came out in January <clears throat> um, looks at RNA-seq data. Uh, how does Penn AI is safeguard the user's data set? This is from your the security and uh, you know, all those aspects. What, what are the security aspects of Penn AI? Uh, yeah, safeguard the user's uh, data, you know, if it's the EHR data, sensitive data. So Penn AI, I didn't have time to mention it, but Penn AI is installed on your own local machine. Um, it's, we don't want your data. It doesn't go to a central server of any kind. Um, you, you install Penn AI on your own server and work with your own data uh, behind your own security. Um, and so that's, and we set it up specifically that way to avoid any security issues. Yeah. 